Washington Commander fans, welcome back to another episode of the Bleeding B&G Podcast, episode 81. So before we get into anything, if you're checking this out on YouTube, be sure to comment, be sure to like, be sure to subscribe. I'm um, seeing that subscriber count um, rise day by day. Um, get me to 1,000, man. Um, that's the goal. Um, you know, the goal is to ultimately monetize off this YouTube thing, and we can't get anywhere unless we get to 1,000. So help me get to 1,000, man. I appreciate it. Um, and let's get into the nitty gritty of today's episode. As I told you, this is episode 81. To give you a timestamp, as I do for all episodes, today is about Monday, May 1st, and it's about 7 p.m. And this is coming off the tails of the 2023 NFL Draft. Yes, the draft has came, and the draft has went. And Washington made a total of seven picks, bringing in seven players in their draft class. And we're just here today to give you our draft reaction to the entire draft class for the 2023 Washington Commanders. As I told you, there were seven players picked in this class um, from rounds one through seven. Um, and we're going to give you guys some kind of in-depth analysis on all of them. Um, try to tell you what I know about all of them, what I feel about all of them. And give you some takeaways from this draft class. Um... Yeah, and this is what we're going to do today. I'm not going to keep you too long. We're going to get them in, get them out, um, and get you guys going with your day. So, as I mentioned before, Washington had seven picks. They came into the draft with one. They actually traded up in the fifth round for defensive end K.J. Henry, and we'll go into that. And that was the only trade that the Washington Commanders made throughout the 2023 draft. So I know a lot of speculation was that we were going to trade back. Uh, it was some speculation that we might trade up for the type of tackle that we wanted early in the first round and things like that. But that did not happen for the most part. Our first trade was made on day three um, where we traded to the top of the fifth round. Um, so that was one of the things that caught my eye uh, about the draft, too. I know that this uh, front office has a philosophy of, you know, trading back and getting as much value and as much stock in the picks that they can but you know it turns out it didn't happen you know marty um mayhew in his um press conference after the first day i think um when they made their first election was mentioning how you know that he didn't have any calls for the trade back for 16 um and he was talking about how that was a stark contrast to what it was last year um when they made their selection trading back from 11 to 16 to select John Dots Jahan Dotson but then in his you know full draft weekend presser recap on Sunday or excuse me on Saturday he started to mention how he wished that he got more trade uh more aggressive um and looking to trade up or trade back in the draft so you know he's kind of talking out both sides of his neck um, and then when you see a guy like Howie Roseman um, getting praised, getting praised for some of the moves that he made um, on draft weekend, it does show a sense of aggression. Uh, I'm not going to be, you know, putting him on this high horse that a lot of the NFL media and a lot of, you know, our social media conglomerate over there, um, our NFL fans, um, our fans in NFL circles, because um, the game still needs to be played. The game still needs to be played. But it was kind of interesting to hear Martin Mayhew say that um, over the course of, you know, the three press conferences that they had um, this weekend. So let's get into this draft class, man. Um, with the round one, pick 16, the commander selected cornerback Emmanuel Forbes. He's 6'1", 166 pounds. Very slight, very slight of build. 166 pounds from Mississippi State. Round two, they picked cornerback Jatavius Quan Martin with pick 47. He's 5'11". He's 195 pounds, and he's a DB from Illinois. Notice I said DB. He's not a safety. He's not a corner. He's just a pure pet football player, and he's going to give you everything he got in that secondary. He's a chess piece in that secondary. Round three, pick 97. This commander selected Ricky Stromberg, center from Arkansas. He's 6'3", 306 pounds. In round four, pick 118, the commander selects 6'4", 294-pound tackle, Braden Daniels out of YouTube. Utah, excuse me, Utah. Yeah, it's all about the YouTube over here. But Braden Daniels is out of Utah. So as you guys have noticed, for the first four picks in the first four rounds, the commanders pretty much stayed pat. Um, didn't move, um, didn't trade forward or didn't trade back. But there, here are where things got interested in the draft. Um, the commanders so, um, traded away one of their seventh round picks, 215, and swapped their fifth round pick with the Buffalo Bills to acquire the pick 137 in the uh, fifth round of the 2023 draft. And they selected 
Defensive end, edge, K.J. Henry out of Clemson University. He's 6'4", 251 pounds. In round six, they selected running back Chris Rodriguez with pick 193. He's about 5'10". He's about 220 pounds. And with their last pick to, um, to you know, put a cap on the draft, with round seven, pick up 233, they selected 6'4", 249-pound defensive end edge Andre Jones from Louisiana, the University of Louisiana, Brian Mitchell's, Brian Mitchell's alma mater, excuse me. So, those were all seven picks that the Washington Commanders made over the draft. And, you know, over here at Bleeding B&G, we're probably giving you the raw, unfiltered analysis, the most honest analysis um, that we can. So, I wanted to sit. Um, I didn't want to give instant reaction to every pick because I see some of my, not, not just some of my YouTube fans, but some of, you know, just the YouTube people. Um, you know, they, they give those instant reactions and I know why they do it. Um, trying to give, you know, as much content out there as possible and things like that, but they give a lot of lukewarm analysis and you know, that's not what we're, um, known here for over here at bleed and BNG. We try to give you the most in-depth analysis. We try to give you the most accurate analysis and we try to act like we know football over here. Not act like we do know football and we try to, you know, put on, put it on showcase each and every episode over here at the bleed and BNG podcast. So I'm going to give you my takeaways from this draft class, man. Um, some things that I noticed, um, some things that um, we may want to look for going into the 2023 seasons and some things that just, Put on your mind. Some things to put on your mind. So one of the first takeaways I took was there were two DBs in the first two selections. You make your strength stronger. You make your strength stronger. Uh, I know a lot of people um, were talking about in my mock drafts and things like that. And I noticed it in a lot of mock drafts. You know, if people didn't select or if that content creator, content creator did not select the offensive lineman in the first round, all our Washington Commander fans were like, boo, that's a horrible draft. And I get it. I get it. The offensive line was one of our weakest points of the um, roster last year. Um, we allowed a lot of sacks and things of, of that nature. But I'm here to ask you guys today. If you didn't like, if I didn't select an offensive lineman in the first round, how did you feel about this actual draft where we didn't select an offensive lineman until round three? So let me get back to my uh, first takeaway is that the DBs, you make your strength stronger. You know, all the talk for years, years has been about this this Alabama wall, this defensive line with four first rounders and things like that. Even though, you know, you have some guys that have lived to that first round billing and some guys who haven't <coughs> Trace young. Um, but you know that they've, they've been, you know, the, the unit that's been having all the higher claim and rightfully so. Um, they were a pretty destructive unit last year with Chase Young missing 14, um, the first 14 games of the season. They still were able to be one of the league's best run defenses and things like that. And they had a quite impressive sack numbers and things like that. But what kept this defense from being elite was the lack of interceptions, was the lack of turnovers, um, and the lack of playmaking, game-changing abilities of that nature. Um, we only had nine picks last year. We only had nine picks last year, and guess what? Emmanuel Forbes had two-thirds of that in his um, last season in uh, Mississippi State. This is the guy who set the FBS record for six career interception returns, and he had 14 interceptions over the course of his three-year career. And what's quite impressive about that, guys, is towards the back half of his second year and this past year, his junior season, teams just stopped throwing at him. For majority of the game. So for him to still come away with these interception numbers, I know everybody has seen the interception that he had on Will Levis on the screen pass that he returned for an interception and things like that. This is a guy that's going to find a way to get his hands on the ball. This is a guy that's going to find his way to get his hands on the ball. And while I was a tad bit upset, not even going to lie to you, in the moment, while I was a tad bit upset that we passed on a player like Christian Gonzalez, Looking back at scheme fits, which you know is very important to the, you know the Ron Rivera's, and just looking back at the field experiment that was in William Jackson, when I look back on it and going over some of Emmanuel Forbes's film, he's probably the most ideal corner um, for this scheme in this entire draft. Deontay Banks included, Devin Witherspoon included. I'm not saying he's the best, but for this scheme, he's probably the most ideal fit. He's coming from Mississippi State, who's played a plethora of zone coverage and things like that. But he is also um, adept at playing man coverage, which we do in a pinch. 
It's not like, I know I've mentioned how we play quarters coverage more than any NFL team, but guess what? When it's time to man up and it's time to play a man mono with mono, you still have to do that in today's NFL. And let me tell you guys a crazy stat that I learned about Emmanuel Forbes. All of six of Emmanuel Forbes' interceptions this past year came in man coverage, and it only came on 15 targets. It only came on 15 targets where he allowed three receptions for a total of 48 yards. But here's the crazy part. Here's the kicker. That's an already amazing feat. 15 targets for only three receptions for 48 yards over the course of a season. But here's the kicker. All six of his interceptions came in man coverage, and he had one pass deflection. So what that tells you is that he got his hands on seven of the balls, uh, seven of the 15 balls that was targeted to him um, in man coverage this past season. That's about 50% of targets that he was able to make a play on. And not only take for the take for an interception, he had three of those this past season. But if it came down to it and he had to simply make a play on the ball to prevent a wide receiver from catching it, he showed the capability of doing that too. This is a guy that's used to playing a lot of off coverage, whether that be in zone and man, and he showed that he has the capability of doing both. This is a guy that flies. I told you guys, I'm tired of corners running four fives and four sixes. This is a four three five corner. This is a four three five corner who's automatically going to be the fastest cornerback in that room the day he steps foot in there. With arguably the best movement and best flexibility skills out of any DB in that room. I love the Emmanuel Force pick. I love it. I love it. You know how you can help an offense out? I know everybody's talking about, oh, we didn't get any help for Sam Howell in the first couple of rounds. You know how you can help an offense out? By changing the field. By shortening the field. By changing the possession. By catching a lot of interceptions. By taking those to the house or putting those points on the board. So guess what? You're letting your offense go out there with a little bit of a cushion. And Emmanuel Forbes is that type of player. My pro cop for Emmanuel Forbes just looking at a couple of his games. And guess what? We've looked at a lot. I don't even want to say a couple. We've really gotten down into the film since Thursday night. Um, all the film that's accessible to us over the internet and things like that. My pro cop for Emmanuel Forbes is Marcus Peters. Prime Marcus Peters. Not the Marcus Peters of the 2022 season who was getting burnt by Tyreek Hill and deep threats every other week. But the former All-Pro Marcus Peters, the Marcus Peters that used to lead the league in interception year in and year out. Marcus Peters as a prospect is my pro comp for Emmanuel Forbes. They have a lot of similarities. While Marcus Peters wasn't 166 pounds, he was real thin coming out of Washington as well. He's somebody that got praised for his high football IQ. Emmanuel Forbes doesn't have the off-the-field concerns that a guy like Marcus Peters had. And they both are susceptible of making game-breaking, game-changing plays in man coverage. Can you can you imagine adding a Kansas City-type Marcus Peters or his first couple of years with the Rams-type Marcus Peters onto this team? With the Ravens, excuse me, onto this team? Onto this defense, with this defensive line? I don't think any of Marcus Peters' defenses on Kansas City had this type of line. Or with the Rams. Or with the Ravens. Not this type of front seven. So can you imagine putting that type of player with this defense? And I think those are the kind of capabilities that Mark, uh, that Emmanuel Forbes can give you. While also being a better off-man cover corner than Marcus Peters ever had. Because Marcus Peters never had 4-3-5 speed. I know a lot of people are going back to Emmanuel Forbes' this freshman year and talking about, oh... Oh, Devontae Smith put up 200 yards on him. Guess what? He was a true freshman, and Devontae Smith did that to everybody. Go look at Emmanuel Forbes' film against Jamison Williams in 2021, which everybody held as the number one receiver before he tore his ACL. Lock him down. Lock him down. Go look at his film against Alabama this year. Notice I'm talking about the elite of the elite talent. Go look at his film against Georgia. This is a guy that had two, te uh, two interceptions against Texas A&M. We forget that Texas A&M was ranked as a top five team going into the season. Yeah, they turned out to be horrible. But this is a guy that made play after play, weekend after week, in the SEC and didn't miss any games at 166 pounds. 
I've heard that his playing weight is more um, closer to 175 pounds, which I would like him to get to because guess what? They do run the ball in the NFC East. But I love the pick of Emmanuel Forbes with pick 16 in round one of the 2023 draft. Going on to round two, pick 47, Jatavius Kwan Mario, 5'11", 195 pounds, doubling down on defensive backs. Now, I'm not going to lie. This is where I wanted us to get aggressive and get our offensive linemen. Preferably an interior offensive lineman. Reports have been coming out since the draft that Washington was was um, looking to trade up early in round two. And I think that it was for one of those interior offensive linemen like a guy like Steve Avila. Who you guys know that we've been highly touting over here over the course of the draft season over here at Bleeding B&G. And I think when Mr. Mayhew, Martin Mayhew, talks about he wanted to get more aggressive trading up and things like that. I think it was at this point in the draft. But guess what? It didn't happen. So you get a freak athlete in Jatavius Quan Martin who had the highest vertical leap of anybody in Indianapolis. Anybody in the city of Indianapolis during the combine did not jump higher than Jatavius Martin with his 44-inch vertical. And after, the, you know, we doubled down on DBs, I told you we made their strength stronger. So I wasn't too mad at the move. Yeah, I would have liked the interior offensive lineman, but I wasn't too mad at the move. But I couldn't help but to think because as I mentioned before, Jatavius Martin is a DB. This is a guy that plays free safety. This is a guy that's played outside corner. This is a guy who I think is going to project project best as the nickel um, in the NFL. So that was one, one thing that came to my mind when I was thinking about the type of player Jatavius Martin is, is that the Cam Curl negotiations can't be going great. Now, I don't want to say, oh, they're going bad. I don't want to say that, oh, it doesn't look like we're going to come to a conclusion or anything like that. But they can't be going great. They can't be going great. Because Jatavius Martin plays a lot of the positions that Cam Curl plays. So unless you're running a dime package with only one linebacker on the field, which I wouldn't put it past this, this, this coaching staff to do, you're either going to have Jatavius Martin, Kendall Fuller, or Cam Curl off the field. Unless you're running the dime. And then if you look back at it, you know, we haven't we haven't re-upped Cam Curl's negotiate, um, contract at this point. So he's still considered like a seventh-round prospect. Jatavius Martin has higher draft capital than that. And I know it's not about your draft status and things like that. But guess what? It is about where the money goes. It is about where the money goes. So that was just something to put your mind on. Um, that, that was one of the first things I thought when we selected Jatavius Martin. Because I know what type of DB he is. I was like, man, those Cam Curl negotiations can't be going well. They can't. But Jatavius Martin is a guy that, like I told you, plays all over the field. This is a guy that I saw motion from, from the free safety position down to the slot and make a tackle in the backfield on a swing pass. And not just any type of tackle, a, a, a hard hit, a shellacking. My pro, camp for, my pro camp for Jatavius Martin. And a lot of Washington fans, if you guys have been watching the team for years and things like that, you guys might like this one, you may not. But I think Jatavius Martin is a more athletic Kyshawn Jerry. Yeah, I know Kyshawn Jarrett was a was a seventh round pick, but Kyshawn Jarrett had one of the best rookie seasons from any Washington Redskin in the 2010s. With his convert unfortunately ending at the end of that rookie year in the last game um, against the Dallas Cowboys. We still don't we still, we still are mad at Darren McFadden for what he did to Kyshawn Jarrett. But if you guys can remember Kyshawn Jarrett, he's, uh, this is a guy that was playing strong safety predominantly at Virginia Tech. But when he came to the Washington Redskins in the 2015 season, he started in the slap. He was effective there. He could move back to safety in the pinch. He was effective there, whether it be free or strong. And this is a guy that made plays. This is a guy that laid the wood. And Jatavius Martin reminds me of a more athletic version of that. I think one of the reasons that Kyshawn Jerry fell to the seventh round was because his athletic numbers weren't as elite as a guy like Quan Martin's. But imagine if you pair those athleticism numbers with the type of player that Kyshawn Jerry was. You have yourself a football player. You have yourself a football player. Moving on to round three, pick 97. Center Ricky Strongberg from Arkansas, 6'3", 306 pounds. I'm letting you know now. Ricky Strasburg will be starting for the starting center position right away. 
Ricky Stromberg will be starting for the starting center position right away. Now, guess what? I know some of you guys are skeptical about the fact that we didn't take our first offensive lineman, or we didn't take any offensive lineman until the mid to uh, late rounds and things like that. And for every good player, like I think Ricky Strawberry is going to be, you do have your Ross Pierce Bakers. You do have your Jerron Christians. You do have your Josh Larebuses. But guess what? Ricky Strawberry isn't that type of offensive lineman to be selected in the third round. This is a guy that was a three-year starter and one of the best offensive lines in the SEC. There's a reason why they call Arkansas the Hogs. And they got, guess what? They have not lost that identity. This is the guy that provides position flex. He played right and left guard in his first year as a starter before transitioning the center and being there for the last couple of, couple of years. Excuse me. This is a guy who I think can excel in that inside zone scheme that I believe Eric Bieniemy wants to bring to Washington. I think that his movement skills, his lateral movement skills are some of his most elite traits. The way that he's able to work up to the second level. And as I mentioned with Jatavius Martin's drafted men for a current player on the roster, I couldn't help but to think, what does this mean for Chase Roulier? He was out there working out in the first week of OTAs with no brace and things like that, but coming off two devastating knee injuries. And I'm telling you know now, those whispers of retirement that were coming out early in the offseason, those didn't come from nowhere. Yet yeah, Chase might want to still play football, but it might not be as a Washington commander, especially after the selection of Ricky Stromberg. They asked Coach Rivera about Nick Gates' potential to play guard. He just shook his head like, he ain't even touching that. Nick Gates is a center. And I was glad to hear that because guess what? that's where Nate, Nick Gates excelled at with the New York Giants. He struggled at the guard positions. So going into training camp and things like that, it looks like it's going to be a competition for the starting center uh, spot between Ricky Stromberg and Nick Gates. Ultimately, I think that Ricky Stromberg has all the capabilities of winning that battle. I think that he's a better athlete than Nick Gates. I think that you want to pair him with a young quarterback, pair a young sitter with a young quarterback to build that relationship so that him and Sam Howell can continue to develop throughout their careers on the same plane. One of the quarterback and the center relationship in, the, in football is one of the most, relation, most important relationships that you can have. So that's why I would be an advocate of, you know, Ricky Stromberg winning the job over Nick Gates, even if it's close. If Nick Gates is clearly whipping his ass in, in training camp, give the job to Nick Gates and vice versa. But if it's close, I'm rolling with the young guy. I'm rolling with the young guy. Shit, you can't have some center play that was worse than some of the shit that we had last season. Moving on to round four, pick 118. We stayed with the offensive lineman. 6'4", 294-pound offensive tackle, Braden Daniels from Utah. Guys, I was, I was big on Braden Daniels going into the draft. Braden Daniels, I wanted to um, actually come up with like some of my draft sleepers. I just didn't have, um, before the draft, I just didn't have the time to. Braden Daniels would have been on that list. And I know it's like, oh, yeah, sure he would have. Guys, he would have. He would have. I've been watching a lot of Braden Daniels f film, particularly for this reason. Braden Daniels seems like the perfect developmental offensive lineman to rock out with in an uh, Eric Bieniemy, uh offense. The reason that I say that is because what do you know, or what is one of the staples of the foundations of that Andy Reid, Eric Bieniemy type offense? It's the screen game, whether that be at the wide receiver position or whether that be coming out the backfield at the running back position. The screen game is essential in an Andy Reid type, Eric Bieniemy type offense. And Braden Daniels, so what, what that means is that you need an offensive lineman that can excel in space. And Braden Daniels is that guy. I mentioned his measurables. He measured into the combine at 6'4", 294 pounds. I think he got up to about 305 um, around his pro day. So he's a little light in the ass. And this one makes him a developmental prospect. His feet aren't the best. But guess what? When he has the proper technique, he has some elite athleticism. This is a guy that ran a sub 5 flat 40. He had some elite athleticism. He's an elite mover in space. 
This is a guy that's going to be able to pull in that inside zone scheme. This is a guy that's going to be able to uh, make release blocks and release blocks in the screen game. Go back and look at Washington last year. We could not have any success or any screen game. I swear our screen games averaged about two yards per 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 attempt throughout the season because fat ass Trey Turner and Andrew Norwell cannot get out there. It's a night and day difference between those type of guys and a guy like Braden Dabbs. This is an elite mover laterally in space. He's kind of light in the ass. He kind of struggles at the point of attack. But that comes when you're weighing in at 294 pounds in the combine. You might want to get him in the weight room for a year or two. You might want to get him in the weight room for a year or two before you want to consider him, um, you know, a week in and week out starter and things like that. But if we're able to get that footwork down, put a little weight on him and get all the twos down, Platt, we may have found our cornerstone franchise left tackle in the fourth round. And you don't often hear that. Like, you don't often hear that. This is a guy that allowed four sacks over 14 and, 1400, and about 1,400 snaps throughout his career in the, at the University of Utah. Guys, there's guys that allowed four sacks in four weeks. He allowed it in four playing seasons. So there's something there. My player call for Braden Daniels is Charles Leno. So take that with a grain of salt. Now, if you're getting 2021 Charles Leno, that's a decent type of football player to be getting in the fourth round. If you're getting 2022 Charles Leno towards the back half of the season, ah, this may be a reach. This may be a bust of a pick. But I'm willing to take a flyer on a guy like Braden Daniels with these elite measurables and these elite um, testing numbers. And that's the thing that I noticed um, throughout the entire class as well. I'm not sure if you guys are familiar with the raw athletic score. You guys have probably seen it if you're on Twitter and things like that. The RAS numbers. Every member of Washington's draft class outside of the running back Chris Rodriguez out of Kentucky posed an elite elite category for their raw athletic scores comparing you know their measurables um to you know their athletic testing numbers considering the size of the player with their athletic um, testing numbers that is how you get that raw athletic score and every member of the washington draft class outside of chris rodriguez posted an elite um raw athletic score ras number and it's something that ron rivera and coach martin may i mean not coach martin may martin mayhew talked about a lot in their pressures they really delved into the analytics i know coach ron has talked about how he's not much of an analytics guy but he mentioned how eric stokes was so it showed that these guys showed a unified conglomerate effort in making these picks so moving on to round five pick 137 we selected defensive end edge, K.J. Henry, out of Clemson. He's 6'4", 251 pounds. This is a guy that's borderline, borderline freaky athleticism. And with Montez Sweat going into his last year of his deal and Chase Young potentially going into the last year of his deal with you not picking up his fifth-year option, you have to bring in an edge. You have to because guess what? Those aren't the only edges that aren't under contract after this season. We have no edges on the roster right now that are under contract for next season other than K.J. Henry. And he hasn't even signed his rookie deal. So that's a technicality. And this is the type of guy that you want to bring in round five. A guy that post elite measurables, um, elite athletic numbers, developmental projects. This is what you're going to get with these mid-round picks. But K.J. Henry's a nice ball of clay that you would like to mold um, and potentially be in something. And I was trying to find a player comp for K.J. Henry. Uh... And I didn't want to give him too elite of a player um, because, you know, he is a fifth-round pick, and he's not somebody who essentially dominated in college. He was a one-year starter at Clemson out of his five years being there and things like that. But I really liked what I saw. Um, he has some capabilities. He has some bend. He has some capabilities set in the edge um, and things like that. So I just looked up K.J. Henry player cops to see what other people thought. And on the NFL um, – NFL.com, you know, draft pro profile and things like that. They comped him to Lorenzo Carter, who used to play with the New York Giants, who is currently playing with the Atlanta Falcons, and I thought that was the perfect comp. I, was, I thought that was the perfect comp. A long limb athlete who still is getting the bases and the fundamentals of football uh, now. 
to still who is still learning how to play football. That's something that you saw out of Lorenzo Cowder earlier in his career with the Giants. Um, and he's been able to turn it around and things like that. And Lorenzo Carter, I believe, was a second-round pick. So to get this type of player in the fifth round, I think was a steal. Um, as I mentioned, he showed some bend. He showed more bend than I've seen from Chase Young since 2020. He showed more bend than I've seen from most of our defensive ends that we have on our roster. Um, and while he's not um, posting these dominant numbers in college and things like that, you get him around a guy like Coach Z. You get him around Coach Ryan Kerrigan and things like that. Teach him a plethora of moves. This is a guy that, that has the foundation to be a de decent type of, you know, situational pass rusher type player. Along with some capability of dropping into coverage, which he did a lot um, in Clemson and things like that. I saw a play where he was dropping into the flats with the running back. The running back turned it up and, um, like a quasi-wheel route, and he was running with him stride for stride. Round six, pick 193. We've uh, selected running back Chris Rodriguez out of Kentucky. Chris Rodriguez is a thumper. I, as I mentioned, this is the only guy that didn't post an elite raw athletic score, and it's because he's slow. I'm not sure exactly what he tested in the 40 at the combine, but, I mean, if you see it on tape, he's not the fastest guy. He's not running away from guys. But let me tell you what he is doing. He's running through guys, and he's bouncing off guys. My player comp for Chris Rodriguez is a diet, diet version of Kareem Hunt. And let me tell you what I mean by that. He's not Kareem Hunt in his first couple of years in the league. He's Kareem Hunt as a prospect coming out of the University of Toledo. And some of the, cap uh, some of the comparisons that I see, some things that I see, um, between the two is that, as I mentioned, not only will he run through you, but he's not the type of like mauler type running back, but he's, he, his contact balance is amazing. So he's, he's, he's bouncing off guys, um, instead of running through their faces and things like that. Guys still have a hard time bringing him down. Um, but he has like tree trunk for legs. Um, I heard that he has some positional flex. He played some fullback at Kentucky as well. And this is a guy um, who was a two-year um, captain at um, Kentucky. And I'm just pulling for him, man. Um, I saw his media availability after he got drafted. And this is a guy that lost his mom in January. And you can see that was affecting him a lot. Um, but this is a guy that seems like he's ready to work. Um, I know a lot of people were talking about getting a scat back and things like that. You know, we were big Keaton Mitchell fans over here um, at Bleeding BNG who ended up going undrafted. But it looks like... Eric B. Enemy more so than anybody else wanted their B. Rob replacement. Um, Chris Rodriguez has been held for his pass, pass blocking, and you don't really hear that coming out of college for a lot of running backs. And that's something that fell off once J.D. McKissick got hurt. So if you can bring a guy like Chris Rodriguez who to fill in that role, he may be able to fill in that you know um, third down running back role. Not not in the sense of having you know an elite pass catcher coming out of the backfield or anything like that, but somebody that can simply keep your running back, I mean keep your quarterback upright on third down when the defense knows you're going to throw the ball. And I did see him catch some passes out of the backfield and things like that. I don't think he's elite by any means, but guess what? Kareem Hunt wasn't elite in that aspect coming out of um, Toledo. But Eric Bieniemy and Andy Reid got him becoming one of the best uh, pass catcher running backs his first couple of years in Kansas City. I see a lot of I see a lot of Kareem Hunt and Chris Rodriguez, and it's no wonder that you know reports came out that Eric Bieniemy was pounding the table for this guy. Um, in the sixth round. All right, to wrap up our draft. Huh, round seven, pick 233. Andre Jones out of the University of Louisiana. 6'4", 249 pounds. Um, I, I, there's not a lot of film on Andre Jones, to be honest. But what I have seen from him, he's a long limb athlete. He provides some bend. Um, I wonder if they have brought him in to potentially play some off-ball linebacker as well. As you see... Um, and this is one of my biggest takeaways from the draft class as well. We did not draft a traditional off-ball inside type linebacker. Um, and I'm wondering if they brought Andre Jones to do that. Um, he mentioned it um, in his uh, media availability that he has done it. I have seen some film of him doing it as well. Um, I'm not sure how comfortable he is dropping back into coverage. But he did say in his media availability, he said the best him is him going forward. If you want the best version of him, make sure he's going forward. And that wouldn't be from the off-ball linebacker position. That would be from the edge position, something that he played almost exclusively in 2022. So that'll do it for this draft class recap, man. Um, I'm excited. Um, it's not a sexy draft class by any means. 
any means. But if you would have went into this weekend saying, what are what are the commander's biggest needs? Your first two would have been the defensive back position and the offensive line position. And we addressed both of those positions with all of our first four picks. Um, to give it a grade, I'm not going to give it a grade because who knows how these guys are going to pan out. I might give it a grade based off just filling our needs um, and just simply filling our needs. I'll give it about a B. B plus range. I know a lot of the pundits are higher than the fans are on our um, grab, draft grades and things like that. Go look around, guys. Mel Kuyper, you know, Daniel Jeremiah. I think that our average range has been about a B. Um, so it's no it's no coincidence that I, I'm filling this draft class. It's not the sexiest draft class by any means. But I think that this front office thinks that we're a French playoff roster. So if we're able to fill the right holes with the right guys, I think that that can take us over the hump. But guess what? The biggest factor going into the 2023 season doesn't have to do with any of these guys. It's the play of Sam Howe. And that's going to be the biggest reason if we fail or succeed in 2023. So that'll do it for this episode of the Bleeding BNG podcast, man. Thank you guys for tuning in. As I mentioned before, if you're checking us out on YouTube, be sure to comment. Be sure to like. Be sure to subscribe. Let's finesse these algorithms, man. If you're checking us out on audio-only platforms like Spotify or Apple Podcasts specifically, leave a rating, man. Leave a review. Uh, five stars preferably if you love this podcast so that when you're searching Bleeding BNG, when you're searching anything Washington Commanders, Bleeding BNG is the first thing that pops up. If you haven't followed us on social media yet, please be sure to do that. Our Instagram is at Bleeding BNG. That's B-L-E-E-D-I-N-G-B-N-G. That's two Gs in our Instagram handle. Our Twitter handle is spelled a tad bit different. That one's at Bleeding BNG as well, but that one's at B L E E D I N. BNG. So there's only one G in our Twitter handle, man. Be sure to check us out, man. The draft has commenced. Rookie mini camp is right around the corner. I've already been hitting up my season ticket rep to see if I can get some exclusives into the OTAs into the rookie mini camps. So be sure to be, you know, looking on the outlooks for, you know, any any potential content, blog type content, um, any exclusive type content from us over here at Bleeding BNG. Thank you guys for tuning in to this episode of the Bleeding BNG. Bleeding BNG podcast, and I'll check in with you guys later. Peace.